Let's take our Bibles and let's go to 1 Kings and the 19th chapter. 1 Kings chapter 19. Unlike this morning, we will stay in this section the entire time. We will reference a verse at the end, which will be on the screens. But we're going to be pretty much expounding through this section of passage this evening. This has been preached recently here, um, but I feel led to do it this evening just based upon a lot of things that have probably been going on in a lot of people's lives a lot of things have been upside down for some of us a lot of things have happened maybe health wise or uh, losing a loved one or or something just happening and there can be a point where you can feel really low you can really feel like what what can i do when christians have a huge successful event that happens the joy and fulfillment is at an all-time high this is when Satan then tries to attack and crush your spirits. Have you ever noticed that any time you've had a spiritual high in your life, next thing you know, it kind of comes crashing down and just seems like it's spiraling out of control or it just seems like that nothing's going your way? Well, sometimes it will get to the point where discouragement sets in and they don't want to do anything anymore. Worse, they feel like they have no one there to help them and they feel lonely. This can cause the mind to think of things that would be undesirable. Well, so the title of the message is Feeling Lonely. And in the scriptures this evening, we're going to be looking at a man who felt lonely. He had a great spiritual victory. He was battling against uh, the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of the groves, calling fire from heaven and that great victory that happens there. And then right after that, he got quickly discouraged. Let's look at verse 12. We're going to come back and highlight this verse in a little bit. But First Kings 19 and verse 12, the Bible says these words. As we open up the scriptures this evening, we're opening up the mind of God. So let's see what he says here, verse 12. And after the earthquake of fire... But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. I want to focus in on those three words and see how we cannot feel lonely this evening. God cares about everyone's circumstance. And that's why I want us to understand as we look into the passage here this evening. Father, we come to you in prayer. We thank you for the day you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to meet here freely. That we can open up the Bible, the accurate, true Word of God, and that we are able to share it freely without any threat of persecution or, or any rebellion or outbreak or outburst. And Father, I pray that you just help us here this evening that we can be encouraged. We can be strengthened and know that we're not alone. That we don't have to feel lonely because we know that there's someone there who can be there for us. Father, help us again to set aside anything that might be distracting us this evening that we can focus in on your word for these minutes here. Help me as I preach. Help it to be clear, easy to be understood, and simple. And we ask these things here in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's take a look back at the beginning of the chapter. We're going to be looking at the first 18 verses of the chapter here. And breaking it up into three uh, different sections here. So first of all, <clears throat> we want to look at in verses 1 through 7, and Elijah flees from persecution. Verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. So Ahab goes back, tells his wife, Hey, I lost. All these things are going on, and I lost all the people who I'm trying to influence to basically worship me. And so Jezebel takes matters into her own hands. Verse 2, Then Jezebel sent the messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Pretty easy to understand here. She wants him dead. She doesn't want him to live. Why? Because she, they, they took out the prophets of the groves and killed all of them, Elijah did, because they're worshiping a false god. And it was essentially a punishment for them for their idolatry. 
And Jezebel's basically saying, okay, you're going to do that to my people. You're going to be just like one of them tomorrow. Now, would you be happy and giddy if someone wanted to say, hey, I'm going to kill you tomorrow? No. No one's going to feel thrilled about their life being hunted. Okay. But what this leads into is the fact that Elijah is going to go into this tailspin, verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. Arguably so, because he wants to live. I don't know of anybody who doesn't want to live unless if they're in a state of depression. And that's really what Elijah is about to spiral into. At first he wanted to flee so he can save his life. So verse 3 continues, And came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And notice this next phrase here. And he requested for himself that he might die. Elijah had literally gone from being this person who's calling down fire from heaven, being confident in the God that he chose and that he worshipped, to now saying, hey, God, just take me home. Why? Because Jezebel wanted to get rid of him. That's all it was. Now, there could have been more to the story that we don't see, but he got into a rough patch. And sometimes in our lives, we get into these rough patches. Hopefully it's not the fact that someone's trying to threaten to kill us, but we get into these rough patches in life where, where things happen health-wise, uh, relation-wise, you name it, and it gets to the point where you might feel like this is too much. In school, maybe there's just a lot of homework and you just can't finish it up in the days that they try to give it to you. I say that because we have a few children in the audience tonight. And you think, man, it's too much for me. I can't handle fifth grade, sixth grade, eighth grade. I passed all that. Yes, we all did. We're here. But it could, it could even be more than that. And here he says, hey, you know what? Let's just end it. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And why does he say that? End of verse 4. And said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than thy fathers. Why was he wanting to do that? Because he did not think he was better than Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and everybody before him. He felt that he was inferior to them. He looked at someone else's circumstance and he said, I'm not like them. I'm never going to be like them. Let me just go ahead and just, just take me home. Just, just take me off of this earth. But, you know, God <clears throat> didn't want to give up on him. Verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, a, a broom tree or broom plant is what it basically translates to, Behold, an angel, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Always feels good to have some food, especially when you're not feeling so great or you're, you're feeling discouraged. And with that, verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. Because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose. We'll stop right there. There, Elijah, at this point, did not want to do anything but eat and die. Now, that's pretty similar to something he experienced just three and a half years ago. Or just a little over three years ago. Because when the drought first came, he went to this widow woman. And she said, we're just, I'm going to bake a cake for me and my son. We're going to eat and then we're going to die. And at that point, Elijah was the one who was encouraging her, saying, hey, feed me first. And then your oil is going to keep on going throughout the three years of drought. Now we come three years later, and now Elijah is in the same exact mindset as that widow in the 17th chapter. So God, Elijah seems like he's not interested in staying on earth any longer. But let's see the reasoning behind it in verses 8 to 17. Secondly, we're going to look at God's reply to Elijah. Verse 8. And he arose and did eat and drink and went on the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. Man, what a what a savings on your grocery bill. 
being able to have enough food and not have to eat for 40 days and 40 nights, I mean, that would save a lot of money. But, but all joking aside, he had enough food to sustain him on his journey. Verse 9, And he came thither to a cave, and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? Maybe God's trying to say, What are you doing? Why are you like this? Why do you feel this way? And here's how he answers. Verse 10. And this could be one of us in here this evening. I have been very jealous or zealous. I've been very uh, on fire for you, God. I've been doing what I've been told that you want me to do. I am very zealous, jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. What's he saying there? I'm alone. No one else is like me. I'm the only one who's doing these things. Everybody else who I know is following Baal, following this false god. And you know what? If they're not going to listen, forget it. I'm, I, don't, I don't need to be here anymore. That's basically what he was communicating. And maybe someone in here is thinking, you know, I feel like I have no one on my side. I feel like I'm all alone. No, no one's there to help me out in my time of need. And you know what? It's not worth it. Let me just go ahead and, you know, no one's going to notice if I just kind of sneak away. Because they're not really contacting me anyway. But God doesn't see it that way. And we ought not to see it that way. Verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind break, uh, rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was on the wind. But after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was on the earthquake. Back to our text verse in verse 12, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was on the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Still here has this idea of this whisper. Or this calm, small, something that's fine. It's not going to be very big or noticeable. It's going to be fine. It's going to be quiet and in voice. When you are discouraged, when you feel lonely, that's the time to reach out for God and try to have God talk to you. That still small voice that comes in and tries to encourage you. Have you ever felt that nudge before? Probably God trying to get a hold of you. And that's how God speaks. He speaks through His Word. He speaks to us, to our conscience, to whatever means necessary to get our attention. And He's trying to get Elijah to listen. You know, and that, that's an important point too. If you really want someone to listen, try speaking very softly. Now you say, I have hearing problems. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll go louder, but if you think about it, if you really want someone to pay attention and listen, you're going to get as small as you can so they can be as focused as they can to listen to what you're trying to say. And that's what God's trying to do with us if we are feeling lonely, we're feeling sad, we're feeling discouraged. Is He's trying to reach out to us and say, hey, I'm there. I'm with you. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my song. He's our wonderful, our merciful Savior, our precious Redeemer and friend. He's our Counselor. He's all of that. He's the one that we praise. He's the one that we adore through the songs we've sung here this evening. Jesus whispers, peace, be still. That's God trying to reach out to us. And we need to be interested in what God wants. But Elijah doesn't pay attention. Verse 13. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering into the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Hey, what are you doing here? He went back into a solitary confinement thinking, That doesn't impress me. Verse 14. And said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword, and I even 
I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Didn't we just read that? Yes, in verse 10. Same exact wording, same exact mindset. He's saying, you know what? I'm the only one left. Everyone else is not doing it. You're welcome. So he has that same mindset. So what does God do? Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return thy way. You know one of the biggest things to do when you're depressed, when you're discouraged, is just go, do something. Because if you're going to sit down and do nothing, it's just going to make you feel more discouraged. Go and find something to do. Find an activity to do. And it, and it can be very difficult. It can be. Because you really, motivationally speaking, just don't want to do anything. You just want to sit on the couch or wherever you're at and just not do something. But one of the ways to come out of that <clears throat> is to do something, to have a purpose, to have something to do to keep your mind off of it. And so that's what God does here in verse 15. He says, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, he's now going to give Elijah a couple of jobs to do. First one is to anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meloah, shalt thou anoint to be the prophet in thy room. So he's going to give him three purposes. Anoint two new kings and to have someone take his place. I think that's a lot of work for someone to do. Get their mind off. Verse 17. <clears throat> and now he encourages him. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And of him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Well, oh, that's very encouraging. In a sense, no, but in a sense, yes. And the fact that, hey, people who are going to be against me, they're, they're going to pay the price. They're, they're, they're going to have those things rectified. So God still shows his power. And his plan. But finally, let's look at how Elijah is encouraged. Let's look at verse number 18. Number 3, Elijah is encouraged. Verse 18. So he departed thence. And oh, That's verse 19. Let me go back to 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So was Elijah alone? No. There were at least 7,000 other people who did not do that. Now, I am going to say that sometimes you may feel that you're lonely and there's not maybe someone nearby you that you think that, oh man, I go to school and I'm the only Christian there. There's no one like me there. I'm sure if you search and find out those who are in school, you'll find someone. Or if you're working, oh man, and it's a big company. If you don't know my job situation. I got all these people who are atheists and, and God deniers and all that. I'm sure if you look enough, you'll find that one person. And that's what God was trying to explain to Elijah here. That, hey, there are 7,000 other people who still follow me. And then you is 7,001. They have not fallen. You're not alone. And what I want to encourage you is the fact that you are not alone. So he would go to Elijah, Elisha's house. He would anoint him to be the new prophet that would take his place, and it would be a few years after that. Let me finish with one other verse this evening. If you want to turn there, you can. But if not, it will be on the screen. Hebrews chapter 13, and verse number 5 and 6. And there's one phrase I'm going to really highlight here. In this, in these two verses, Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. So let your conversation, your lifestyle, your speech, whatever it is, be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he saith, here's the phrase, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Folks, God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And in the Greek, it's a double negative, which means it encourages the fact that he'll never, never leave you. He'll never, never forsake you. 
There will be people in this world who will forsake you, whether this, whatever the situation might be. But God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You're feeling discouraged. You're feeling lonely. I'm not going to leave you. It will be that still small voice that comes in and encourages you. And so that way we can say in verse number 6, that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God's never going to leave us. God's going to never forsake us. Now, in conclusion, when we're all alone, we need to come to God. When we're at that point where we're discouraged, we're at that point where we're like, man, I don't know. feels lonely here. I'm the only one that's doing these things. My health is declining. Whatever it is going on financially, I'm not doing well. I don't know how to get out. Well, let God come in. Let God take a hold of it. Let God take control. Let Him care for you and encourage us. It also helps to fellowship with believers too. Know that you're never alone in this life. You at least have God. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But you know what? We also have the fellow fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that are in this room and other Christians that are in this world. So you're never alone. But the time can come and, and does come when people do get depressed, when people do get discouraged. And when that time comes, I'm not saying if it comes. It's, it, it comes. It's, it's a natural, <clears throat> it's a human emotion that comes in life. But when you feel depressed, when you feel discouraged, know that God will never leave you. And that he'll never forsake you. And he'll be that still small voice to try to come in and encourage you. Say, hey, you're doing well. Finish the fight. Fight the good fight. Finish the course. Keep the faith. And that's what he wants to encourage us with this evening. Don't be discouraged. Don't feel lonely. Because God is always there for you. Father, we come to you in prayer. We thank you for the day you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to share the word of God this evening. Father, I pray that you would just help us here. Father, I don't know what's going on in the minds and hearts of those who are here this evening. But I pray that you would just help us to be encouraged this evening, knowing that you're there. Knowing that you will always be there. No matter what the circumstance is. Father, we will feel discouraged. We're going to feel depressed. It's just a thing that happens in life. But when we get to those states of mind, may we just reach out towards you and that we can be encouraged by the great things that you've done because you are the wonderful and merciful Savior. We can trust in Christ alone. No matter what depths of height or whatever it is, we can always trust you because we're not alone when, we're in, when we are in you. The invitation is this. God spoke into your heart. You need to do business with him. You can do it right there at your pew, or you can come up to an old-fashioned altar, and you can just cry out to him and help him to ask him to help you. If you're feeling discouraged, you're feeling lonely, you want someone to pray with, I'll be available down front. But, even if you're not, pray for those who might be. Pray for those who you know that need the prayer to uplift them and encourage them. Father, bless and move in this invitation time. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. As the music just silently plays, turn your eyes upon Jesus. The invitation is this. God spoke into your heart. Take this time here as the music plays quietly for a stanza or two. And just come to him. Talk to him. As the, as the piano plays quietly. Pray to the Lord and seek him.
soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's hope for a look at the Savior, but life more abundant and free. That's what the first verse tells us. We can not, don't have to be weary and well-doing because we have God there and Jesus there with us. We're going to go ahead and pick it up at the chorus there as the music proceeds there. We'll sing just the chorus of this hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's sing that chorus out together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We'll close the service here. The invitation is still open. You want someone to speak with, I'll be available. My wife will be available. One of us will be available. Some of them here, you want someone to talk with, and we'll be there for you. And we'll try to help you. And if not, we can find the one who does. We're going to pray. And then we're going to close with a chorus of his name is wonderful. Father, we come to you in prayer. We just pray that now as we dismiss that you just help us as we go our separate ways to keep us uh, safe as we head out. And encourage us to see this week um, that we can just uh, follow you. That we can know that even though we may feel alone, that you're always there for us. And you always will be there for us. That you will never, ever leave us or never, ever forsake us. Father, I pray that you just keep us safe, bring us back here again on Wednesday night and again on Sunday. Let's be able to worship you. And when they said, it was, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go into the house of the Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.